thank you for coming. I know it's the after lunch slot, so everybody's a little sleepy. I know I am usually. I hope you brought coffee or tea or something. And I thank you for joining me. And we're gonna spend almost an hour talking about um, some already present um, constructs and objects in the standard library and some new stuff coming in C++20 and maybe some even more exotic stuff coming even later. And we're gonna discuss all of this through our regular lens and do some, some, some a little dry mathematical analysis of the, of the subject and hopefully we'll draw some useful conclusions out of all the theory. Uh, I'm um, Victor Sura, like I said. I've been working on uh, Advanced Installer for over a decade now, uh, building a large uh, set of tools and applications, helping clients uh, virtualize and migrate their Windows applications to a new application format, MSIX. And I've been known to uh, tinker with our huge code base and modernize it and even build tools to help along the way, such as Clank Power Tools. Uh, has anyone seen one of the versions of my previous talk on regular types? Anybody? No? Okay, excellent. Because I'm gonna spend a little bit of time um, reviewing uh, those aspects and reiterating the, the important bits before we uh, really dive in and uh, analyze uh, some of the examples, the good and the bad parts of the designs in the library features in C++17 and coming in 20. So why regular types? Why are we talking about this? Well, <coughs> it's, a, it's a moment to reflect back on STL and its design principles. And as best stated by Alexander Stepanov in his seminal paper from more than 20 years ago now, the fun on fundamentals of generic pro programming. And we shall see that regular types naturally appear as necessary foundational blocks for building uh, programs. And we we'll try to investigate the requirements that uh, STL imposes on our types and its types in order for algorithms to work properly. But this talk is not, about, not just about regular types. It's about values, about objects, concepts, as defined by the next standard, ordering relations, requirements on types, about equality, which you'll see it's a difficult subject to define properly, about whole part semantics for objects, about object lifetimes, of course about standard span because it's in the title, about CPP core guidelines, and we shall see bits and pieces of, of these uh, ideas in uh, C++ 17, 20, and even stuff coming later on. Has anyone seen uh, this two-part series of talks by Titus Winters from CPPCon. Okay, uh, just one hand. <laughs> I, I do highly recommend that you uh, watch them when you have the time. And I'm gonna draw your attention to uh, part two, which focuses on type properties and what properties can describe types and type families that is combination of properties that make useful type design. But let's start with the basics. Before we uh, begin analysis, we have to uh, build a common vocabulary so we know what we're talking about as a group. And uh, feel free to interject if we have uh, questions or opinions. So a datum is a finite sequence of zeros and ones. That's it. Um, a value type is a correspondence between a species and a set of datums. A value is a datum together with its interpretation. For example, an integer represented that 32-bit tools complement in big Endian architecture is a value, and the value cannot change. And if a value type is uniquely represented, equality means representational equality. If a value is not ambiguous, if a value type is not ambiguous, representational equality implies equality. And an object, not is as in OOP object, but as in computer architecture object, is a representation of a concrete entity as a value in computer memory, characterized by address and length. And an object has state, 
and the value uh, of that value type. Uh, so the state of an object can change as opposed to the value itself. A type is a set of values with the same interpretation function that give it a meaning and operation on these values. And the concept is just a collection of similar types that share some properties. Has anyone heard of EOP? EOP? So EOP stands for Elements of Programming. It's this book right here by Alexander Stepanov. Uh, it talks about the foundation of uh, programming concepts, about operations, orderings, concepts, iterators, uh, algebraic data types, and various algorithms and strategies of composing algorithms. Um, as a good news, uh, as of this year, is available as a free PDF on the official website there. So it's very handy to, if you want to look up stuff, and it's searchable, and you can reference stuff from it. Much, much more easier than the tip, uh, printed version I have here. Much more obscure acronym there, FM2GP. Anybody guessing? No? Uh, it's this book, From Mathematics to Generic Programming. Um, and this book follows a story uh, of starting with uh, Egyptian multiplication, like uh, 2000 BC, and uh, going through number theory, Euclid's GCD algorithm, abs various abstraction uh, stages in mathematics, and deriving generic algorithms, all the way up to the 20th century with uh, RSA. It's a fantastic book. And it has a little bit of uh, history tidbits, and it's very entertaining to, to follow along. And it's all about uh, because of this guy, Alexander Stepanov. But where am I going with this? Well, my point is that ma mathematics really does matter. And I think uh, this presentation by Alex a few years back is a profound presentation for uh, our field. And I think uh, everybody has a, a a duty to at least watch it once. And it, it's full of wisdom and important concepts that profoundly influence the way we have to think today about programming, specifically uh, if, we're, if we think about uh, generic algorithms and STL. So the mathematics really is the language that uh, we use to think and uh, internalize uh, nature and scientific processes, and it is the way we should think about programming as well. But you might say that, hold on, I've been programming for X number of years, and I've never needed any math to do it. Uh, and I don't really believe you. Uh, and the reason that things just worked for you is because others have thought long and hard, and they've built abstractions and algorithms and uh, concepts that uh, made it easier for you to use it in an intuitive way, S uh, giving you a feeling that uh, you don't have the pressure of actually building everything from first principles. So stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. And to further emphasize my points for the really enthusiastic so of you, uh, I'm going to recommend a pretty big series of uh, lectures uh, given by Alex at A9. It's all about. Uh, an algorithmic journey that you're going to take with, uh, with him and his class, and exploring various concepts in mathematics as they evolved over the years. And it's all the way a parallel to programming concepts and building uh, abstractions and generic algorithms from these ancient ideas. It's a fantastic resource, many hours. I've seen it all, and it's fabulous. Uh, and uh, I do recommend that you you follow along. So it all leads up to this, Fundamentals of Generic Programming, the, the, the paper uh, from 98. And generic programming depends on the composition of programs into components that may be uh, developed separately, but combined arbitrarily, and subject to def well-defined interfaces. And among the interfaces of interest, the most pervasively and unconsciously used and the are the fundamental operations common to all C++, C++ types and including built-in types. And the way we extend these semantics to our user-defined types that we construct, like assignment, equality, copy construction, and so on. And we must investigate the relations which must hold among these operations to preserve consistency with their semantics, with the built-in types, 
and with the expectation of the programmers that are using our libraries or our APIs. In other words, we want a foundation powerful enough to support any sophisticating programming task, but simple and intuitive to reason about. But is simplicity a good goal? Uh, we are C++ developers, are we not? We thrive on complexity. Well, I just hate it when C++ developers uh, brag about being able to comprehend some complicated concept and uh, showing off to others. So I think we should strive for simplicity. And simple code is more readable code. Uh, unsurprising code is more maintainable. Code that moves complexity to abstractions often has fewer bugs. And compilers and libraries are very often much better than us uh, at doing stuff. So simplicity is an act of generosity, not just for you, but for others that work with you. So we should strive for this. And I'm going to draw your attention to a recent paper, uh, again by Titus Winters, uh, re revisiting regular types, which evokes the Anna Karenina principle for designing proper types in terms of that uh, good types are all alike. Uh, each poorly defined type, it's poorly designed in its own way. So to paraphrase Tolstoy. So I think this paper is both the best up-to-date synthesis on the original Stepanov paper from 21 years ago, as well as a good investigation in what it, what it means to using known values as if they are regular types. And we're going to see some prominent examples in this talk, string view and span. And the analysis provides the basis to evaluate non-owning references. And we should uh, investigate how we can deal with these kinds of uh, new vocabulary types in terms of uh, trying to stay uh, close to the regular design principles that STL expects and programmers expect. So we'll have to go back a little bit to STL and its design roots. And if you want the absolute original presentation on this, uh, Ste Alex Stepanov gave a lecture at uh, Adobe Systems back in uh, 2002. So again, a very good presentation. I do recommend you follow on the early days of STL and its adoption and the reception in the community. And I'm going to draw some uh, main uh, points from this presentation to uh, build a framework for us to analyze further. So fundamental principle, systematically identifying and organizing algorithms and data structures. Seems obvious now. Finding the most general representation of algorithms, not always easy. Using whole part value semantics for data structures. I think this bit eludes us as a community in general. So we, we tend to have difficulty defining proper data structures that uh, enforce this rule. And using abstraction of addresses, that means iterators and nowadays ranges, uh, as an interface between algorithms and data structures. Again, seems obvious in hindsight, but back then, this was brand new. And algorithms are associated to, with a set of common properties, for example, uh, addition, multiplication, mean, max, are all associative operations. And because of that, you can reorder operands, and you can parallelize and re reduce operations. So it gives you automatic scalability just drawing on these common properties. And they're a natural extension of 4,000 years of mathematics. And of course, that there is a generic algorithm before, uh, behind every while and for loop. I think after uh, Sean's talk, influential talk a few years back, Everybody should have this intuition by now. So STL data structures extend the semantics of C structures. Uh, and two objects should never intersect. They should, have separate, they should be separate entities with separate lifetimes, if possible. And STL data structures do have whole part semantics. When you copy the whole, you copy the parts. When the whole is destroyed, all the parts are destroyed. Two things are equal if they have the same number of parts and their corresponding parts are equal. So makes sense, but like I said, we usually break this rule when designing our, our own types. We, we tend to forget this when we get very practical and mash up all the things in our types. 
Generic programming does have its drawbacks, like uh, very rarely abstraction penalty. You have the implementation interface in C++, early binding, horrible error messages because we don't have a formal specification of interfaces yet. We're going to have it soon. Duck typing, the algorithm could work for some data types but fail to compile when you later apply it to some other data types which, which don't have the required semantics. So in order to get this to work, uh, we need to fully specify requirements on the algorithm types. That means what requirements does my type need to meet in order for this class of algorithms to work on it. So a few examples of named requirements in the STL. Uh, not going to go through all of them. Um, so named requirements are used in the normal, normative text of the C++ standard to define expectations of the standard library. And we're going to see some examples. Uh, some of these requirements are being formalized as C++ 20 using concepts. And until then, uh, the burden uh, is on the programmer to ensure that the library templates are instantiated with the uh, template arguments that satisfy those requirements. Otherwise, we know the horrible error messages. And sometimes uh, it all compiles fine, but the behavior is not what we expect. But what is a concept anyway? Formal specification of concepts makes it possible for us to verify those template arguments that they satisfy the expectations of the, the function and during overload resolution, of course. Each concept is a predicate evaluated at compile time. It becomes part of the interface of that function, of that algorithm, and it's used as, it, as a constraint. Uh, if you've been following along, uh, maybe you've heard that uh, the proposal of uh, C++ concepts in C++ 20 have been, uh, has, been, has suffered a recent uh, renaming. So they, they went from Pascal uh, camel case to snake case. Um, I thank uh, Adi for this uh, wonderful depiction of what happened there. Uh, anybody see, read uh, Little Prince? No? I'm reading it right now with my daughter. So um, we basically went from this on the left to that on the right. And my personal rant, um, I like the original Pascal case notation uh, because, uh, and by the way, uh, all these rationales are properly explained in the papers uh, proposing the rename. But I, I'm on the other side, so I get the stage, I get the rant. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think it's desirable to make concepts stand out because it's something new and it's something that it's very different from anything else we've had in the standard. Uh, they're not types. Concepts are not types. So giving them a regular naming scheme uh, to be uniform with the other types in the standard, I think, leads to confusion. Um, we might want consistency with the standard notation for template parameters. For example, if we take basic string, the std string uh, template, the template uh, types are all using Pascal notation. So, and it leads to a little bit of confusion with type traits. Those of us who've, who've been using type traits might be confused by concepts uh, being very similar in naming with type traits. So, and not always giving the same results. Subtle, subtleties are there. So my preference was the Pascal notation, but what can you do? So what's the practical ups upside? Uh, if I'm not a library developer, why do I care about all these things? Well, because you're hopefully using STL algorithms and data structures and because when you design your own types and your own vocabulary types and APIs and public interfaces, you need to think about the expectations of programmers and you need to uh, meet the expectations with regards to uh, what they're, they're accustomed to in terms of using the standard library, for example. I'll give you just a short example. Um, the sort algorithm from uh, STL uh, expects a compare predicate. And what are the requirements on a compare type? Well, it must be some kind of function object. Uh, that's a predicate. It's a binary function, binary predicate per se. And it looks something like this. But what kind of ordering relationship is needed between the elements of the collection? 
how can we compare stuff? If we define our own types, what's the criteria we're going to use? What uh, properties does our criterion needs to meet in order to, for sort to work properly? So we'll have to see this. Uh, the standard says it must be strict weak ordering. And if you do a random uh, uh, survey, if uh, programmers actually understand what strict weak ordering is, you're not going to be very impressed. But intuition tells you how it should behave. Uh, if we must formalize it, it must satisfy these axioms. Uh, irreflexivity, antisymmetry, transitivity, and importantly, transitivity of equivalence, because it's important to, uh, to have this property in case you cannot decide if A goes before B or B goes before A. Uh, in my previous t uh, talk on regular types, I gave a very thorough uh, go through, uh, through this, this analysis using some uh, examples, and I'm going to refer you to that talk if you want to learn more. Uh, so, like I said, uh, most programmers uh, won't be able to give you a formal uh, specification and explanation like this one, but they have built an intuition on how they should implement uh, a predicate for comparing uh, types during a sort, for example. And uh, we'll see that, intu that intuition comes from a parallel with the built-in types and the standard library types and how they behave. Very closely re related to strict weak ordering, we have the less than comparable uh, requirement. And it's the same thing as before, but instead of the generic <coughs> comparator, we use the less than mathematical relation. And the equivalence is same, the same thing. And so far, we've covered a bunch of requirements. And we're going to focus now on equality comparable. And we'll see that this one is a little more difficult to grasp. And again, we have to define a, a vocabulary. And we shall define a semi-regular type, something that is default constructable, move constructable, copy constructable, move assignable, blah, 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 swappable, and destructible. And a regular type is a semi-regular type that is equality comparable. And why is this important? Because uh, Regular, as in Stepanov regular, as I'll call it, as STL assumes equality is always defined, or at least an equivalence relation, for all its types and the types we provide into it. And algorithms assume regular data structures. STL was written with regularity in, at its core. And I'm going to refer you to another older paper, the Palo Alto Technica report, uh, written by a week or so of uh, debates and discussions by lots of very smart people. It's a, it's a very nice paper. Uh, by the way, uh, everything that's links in, uh, in my slides is navigable. So later on, uh, when you get the slides, I do encourage you, if you're interested, to follow on the links and uh, investigate on your own. I do have plenty of references in my slides. So getting back to equality. Um, the axioms that must stand for an equality is reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. We know this from uh, high school math or something like that. Yeah. And the type must work with uh, a com uh, comparator operator, and the results should have standard semantics. We cannot impose some weird behavior or uh, the, the equality uh, yielding some weird uh, semantics that we're not, uh, not expecting. So there is a, a distinction between equality and equivalence. And for types that satisfy both equality comparable and less than comparable, STL makes a clear distinction between those two. And equality and equivalence are defined as shown here. And we can easily see that equality is just a special case of equivalence. And we say that uh, equality builds a uh, it's both an equivalence relation and builds a partial ordering relation. So defining equality is hard. Uh, as uh, Stepanov himself uh, said in that paper, 
two objects are equal if their corresponding parts are equal applied recursively, including remote parts, but not comparing their addresses, excluding inessential components, and excluding components which identify related objects. So kind of a long-winded <laughs> definition there. And um, Stepanov himself says that uh, this definition leaves room for judgment because it's not always the case that it's uh, so clear cut for our types. So strictly related to this and less than comparable concept, we have in C++20 the spaceship operator, a very quick overview. It brings consistent comparison op operations to types. I think it's a, a, a wonderful addition and it's very useful and saves you a lot of boilerplate code to write. And um, the theory behind it and the specification in the standard, it's much more than we had on, the, on this slide. So it's all about defining comparison uh, categories and uh, types of orderings and uh, the, some kind of relations between these types of orderings. And I will caution you about weak equality here because uh, there li lies uh, a problem. So the mothership has landed and very recently we we have uh, operator spaceship in throughout STL, so for uh, its data structures and types. So that should make things a lot more uh, easy for us. I think it's a, this is a great contribution. And if you want to, this is if this is something very new to you and you want to read up more, I recommend two resources here to get you started. They're they're not advanced at all. There are, they have examples and it's easy to follow along. So uh, going from theory to practice, if you want to uh, dip your toes and uh, you can try out the examples in these blog posts. Now, getting to C++17 string view, our first candidate for analysis. analysis. Um, string view is a class template uh, that describes an object that can refer to a constant continuous sequence of char-like characters, char-like objects. And it does not manage the storage it refers to. The lifetime is up to the color, obviously, hence the name, view. And I have a whole talk that I did last year on string view. If you want to learn more about uh, problems with string view and uh, some guidance and some perils there and what it's good for. And again, we should see a few of, of these things today. I do recommend that you watch that. And um, does anybody know why I have this watermark on this slide? Do you recognize it? Rust, yeah. So uh, Arthur O'Dwyer has a very nice uh, article, uh, very accessible and uh, insightful, I think, on string view. And uh, he defines it as a borrow type, borrowing from Rust terminology there. And String view basically succeeds admirably at the goal that, we, that was its design goal to be a dro drop-in replacement for a const string reference for parameters. The problem is that um, it's something new. Um, up, to, up to C++17, we were used to object types that have reference semantics and value types that are values. So string view is neither. It's a new kind of beast and Arthur calls it a borrow type. And borrow types are essentially borrowed references to existing objects. They lack ownership, they are short-lived, hopefully. Uh, they generally can do without an assignment operator, um, although for string view that's not the case. They generally appear only in function parameter lists and cannot be stored safely in data structures or returned from functions because problems like that. And all about these kinds of problems, uh, you can find details in, and examples in my other talk on string view. Um, string view is perhaps the first mainstream borrow type. We've seen these kind of things uh, in exotic types in STL before, but those are types that are not used that much so, or are used by lab library developers or STL maintainers. And String view begs to be used by mere mortals like us in mainstream code. So it's very, 
it's very inviting as a type, very appealing. And its value proposition is good. So that's why we need to be very careful that we understand and use it properly. So StingView is assignable, but assignment has shallow semantics. And uh, because this, this is okay because uh, the underlying strings are immutable. So we're pointing, we have a view to a constant, a continuous sequence of characters. Meanwhile, the comparison has deep semantics because that's what you would expect when comparing two string views. You would expect to compare the strings behind that they point to. So like a lexicographic compare. So already we have some interesting design choices here. So people need to be aware of this. So when the underlying data type is extant and constant, we can kind of determine the rest from analyzing the context. And we can see if this usage looks regular. And when used properly as a function parameter, string view works well, uh, as if it's a regular type. So it's not quite regular, but in properly used contexts. And if we, by construction, know that the, the, the data it points to, it's still around, and because it's constant, we kind of can use it like, as if it's a regular type. So not great, not terrible. And we get to span. So span, it's, a, it's an interesting design. So it's a very confusing type that the world's best C++ experts are not quite sure what to make of. And we're going to see why. Think of span as in array view, as in we've seen string view, but the underlying data is mutable. This is a big difference. So we'll have to go to the historical background for this. It all originated in the C++ core guidelines. Uh, have you heard of the core guidelines? Pretty old by now, 2015 or 16, I think. So we have F24 clause, it's properly organized, like a legal document, I love that. <laughs> um, F24, use span T or span PT to designate a half open sequence. Uh, and pro bounds, bounds safety profile. What do those mean? Well, um, informal non-explicit ranges are often a source of errors. That's true. And ranges are extremely common in C++ code. Again, true. We're accustomed to using pointers. But they're typically implicit, and their correct usage is hard to ensure. OK, true. Uh, given a pair of arguments, p and n, uh, designated by p n, p plus n, in general, it's impossible to know if there really are n elements that we can access safely after dereferencing p and going forward. So kind of have to be careful and understand the context and see where the data comes from. GL, GSL span, uh, GSL stands for Guideline Support Library. Uh, it's a small header library that uh, comes with the core guidelines and helps you uh, build your applications and helps uh, tool vendors to build better tools. We're going to see more about that. Uh, span and span T were designed to solve this problem by giving it an explicit context making you explicitly say you define this range and taking this range as a parameter, as opposed to taking a pair of iterators or a pair of pointers or a pointer plus a length. Is it like a uh, splice in code? Almost. <laughs> because the main difference being splice is checked, is bounds checked. Um, so you don't have any runtime support here. If you make mistakes, you make mistakes. There's no runtime. Um, and the bound safety profiles uh, gives us good recommendations. Don't use pointer arithmetic. Use span instead. Uh, only index into arrays using constant expressions. Makes sense. Uh, no array to pointer decay. Mm. Generally good advice. Uh, don't use standard library functions and types that are not bounds checked. Well, OK. Sometimes we want performance. We cannot always afford bounce checking. 
and a few links there on passing pointers to single objects, about pointer arithmetic, and uh, using STL in a type safe manner. Uh, all interesting uh, with examples and interesting uh, recommendations. How does this relate to our span discussion? Well, like I said, uh, the core guidelines come with GSL, the GSL library, and this includes types like span, string span, owner, and others. Many useful st uh, stuff. And it, its purpose was to introduce helpers before things get standardized, so you can get early access and experiment and use them right now before they get uh, standardized. And Microsoft and others have been maintaining this implementation. And the span proposal that we have now in uh, C++ 20 uh, comes directly from the C++ core guidelines from GSL explicitly and is intended as a replacement for unsafe pointer and length parameter pairs. So we expect it to be pervasively used as a vocabulary type for function parameters in particular. This quote is directly from uh, um, Herb Sutter. Um, okay. And we have tools to help with this. We do have automatic checkers. Uh, both in, uh, so we have uh, core guideline checkers that are installed by default with Visual Studio 2017 and 2019. And there's a NuGet package for uh, Visual Studio uh, 2015 if you're on the, the older version. So from Visual Studio 2015 to up to 2019, you get most of the checks there in the box and you have LLVM Clang Tidy that has many checks related to CPP core guidelines. And if you like to combine both, like I do, you can use Clang Power Tools. That's a plugin for Visual Studio. And uh, it uses LLVM Clang Tidy on the Visual Studio projects, if you want. So you can have both of uh, both the worlds, so to speak. And automatic checkers, for example, uh, in LLVM Clang Tidy, we have uh, two checks that are re relevant to this discussion. Uh, array to pointer decay and bounce pointer arithmetic. And basically it does uh, check the recommendations in those two clauses that uh, I showed you earlier. And they generally work well. Uh, this is the case for Visual Studio. You have settings to control which um, uh, checks you run and uh, warning codes that are of interest to our discussion today. Uh, if we see a, a small, very trivial example of this, uh, you can see the lines where these warnings are emitted. You have a legend there uh, for each uh, error code to see what it means. And you do have a way to suppress those warnings locally, if you wish. Uh, personally, I think it's ugly, but if that's the way you want to go, uh, it's, there, it's an option. If you want to read more, I linked to the documentation, and uh, you can certainly have your way with it. I, I love automatic checkers. I use them. But in this case, I think it's more noise than benefit for uh, spans in general. Uh, like this example that I uh, picked up from Twitter. Uh, don't use pointer arithmetic. Use span instead. And that's developer's reaction. <laughs> um, you don't have to understand the code, just the fact that uh, some innocent uh, pointer addition there it should give you in a pretty large code base. You can imagine the, uh, the amount of false positives this checks might bring, check might bring. Or this one that recommends using span instead. I don't know. I'm not sure I would recommend using span here. So in general, these, are, these reviews are a little skewed because they come from the games industry, but <laughs> and they're not such big fans of uh, modern C++ techniques. But uh, I think I share the sentiment. I, I wouldn't jump on fixing stuff that, that these checkers uh, start to percolate in my code base. Because it's very easy to introduce bugs and make code even more unreadable than it is now. <laughs> so getting back to span, this is how it looks back like. It's basically a pointer in a size. It can have either a static extent or a dynamic extent. So uh, we can see this by the way we can construct it. You can construct it from a, a static array, or you can have a dynamic size, which is to be expected. Um, 
notable functions, front, back, uh, index operator, data, um, getting the span as bytes or as writable bytes for streaming. Um, useful stuff. Um, first, last, you can get subviews and subspans, just like with uh, string view, you can have remove prefix, remove suffix, stuff like that. So things that you would expect for a view-like object. And useful stuff. Uh, there have been some uh, usability enhancements in, in span over, over time. For example, the two front and back member functions that were added actually to uh, have consistency with uh, standard library containers, for example, like vector. Um, again, for consistency, uh, we've marked this, uh, empty as no discard to, because it's a, such a crazy name, but being consistent with vector is a requirement, I guess. Removing operator uh, parentheses. This is a vestigial trace from the back in the original proposal when we, it was designed as an array view, as a multi-dimensional uh, span. So it's not really uh, necessary. And being able to use structure bindings with fixed size spans, again, it's a very useful construct. And we have some uh, utilities there, uh, some functions to get to the tuple elements and uh, span uh, pieces out of it when it, when it has a um, static extent. Um, WWSD, what does this mean? What would Stepanov do? Getting back to, <laughs> getting back to the beginning of the talk. So, I don't know. I, I, I think he would quit at this point. <laughs> but um, let's see. Uh, I like this paper very much. Uh, I, I don't read a lot of uh, standard proposals. I read some, but not a lot. I'm not part of the committee, so uh, I'm just here to rant. Uh, I would help, but uh, I mainly rant. <laughs> but I like this paper uh, by uh, Tony Van Aert. And should span be regular? Uh, <laughs> true story, I didn't know about this paper until I started, uh, until I proposed this talk and I started researching this talk. So coincidence in the title? I think not. Um, but <laughs> uh, it's a very nice paper and it starts uh, <laughs> copy or copy not, uh, there is no shallow. Um, and gives a, gives a very succinct and uh, insightful analysis on span at, as it was um, almost a year ago, uh, and gives some strategies, some recommendations on how we can deal with it. And I'm going to enumerate some, some of these things to now. Overloading, overloading operators can be dangerous when you change the common meaning of the operator. We've seen this when it, we talked earlier about comparison. We cannot make it mean something else. We could, but it's not something we would expect. The meaning of copy construction and copy assignment is to copy the value of the object. This is generally what people expect. The meaning of equals and less than is to compare the value of the object. Copy, assignment, and equality are expected to go together as, it, as if for built-in types. So if we copy something or we assign something and then we test for equality, we expect to get consistent results. When we design a class type, wherever possible, we should strive to make it regular. And uh, Tony makes a direct reference to this yellow book, Elements of Programming. And the copy for span is shallow. So it just copies the pointer and the size. Uh, and we have two strategies. We can make the comparison deep. The elements of the span are compared using standard equal, and uh, what this, this, is was, uh, this was actually the first design of span, just like with string view. Uh, all the way through this talk, I'm going to make parallels to string view, because people are going to make it, uh, are going to make them, because string view is already there, and it's inviting to compare it to something you know. Uh, so the initial implementation was a deep uh, compare. That means comparing the, each element in the span. However, string view can't modify the elements it points to because it's a constant buffer as opposed to span. So 
shallow copy of string view is similar to kind of a copy on write optimization. So kind of that kind of thing when you implement like a string class and you use copy on write for it. So shallow copy for string view makes perfect sense. And like I said earlier, deep compare is something that I think everyone would expect for a string view or a string type. But for span, we're talking about generic memory. We're not talking about strings. Anything can be in a span. So span, is span a value? Do we need a deep compare for span in, in all its generality? Uh, span is trying to act like a collection of the elements of which it spans. So it gives you the feeling that it's a drop-in replacement for, uh, for a vector. But it's not regular as it stands. Basically, span has reference semantics. Anyway, anywhere you try to cut it, span is basically a span ref. And a deep comparison operator implies deep const as in logical const. That means extending the const protection to all its parts, a thing that is properly analyzed in elements of pro programming in general. And all the parts of that type that constitute its value and participate, for example, in comparison operator or in copy. So all the parts that you compare or that you copy, all those parts should be const protected if we go that route. And deep equality means the value of the span elements it spans, not just pointers and size. We talked about this already. So if we want span to act like a lightweight representation of element it references, we need to sh a shallow comparator that compares just the viewport. Right? That means the pointer and the length. So uh, if we want it to be a lightweight helper object, then we, it implies shallow semantics, and we cannot impose logical const anyway. So. We, we're kind of drawn to this conclusion that shallow const means shallow compare. But shallow compare might be really confusing to users, especially if they already know string view and other types in STL. For example, uh, vector does not do shallow compare. Vector does deep compare. Huh? Yeah. So. Uh, a shallow compare would be com really confusing for people using it. So the final decision was to actually remove the compare altogether from span. So this is the actual uh, state it's in right now. So, but this, is make, this makes it highly irregular. So it's definitely not a regular design by now. So it's a case of, it's a strange beast. It's a case of unmet expectation span. Users of STL can reasonably expect span to be a drop-in replacement for a const vector reference, just like string view is for a const string reference. And that happens to be mostly the case. It works. Until, of course, you try to copy or change its value, and then it stops acting like a vector. It's a, it's a totally different beast altogether. So span is at most semi-regular. It's kind of like this. Uh, by the way, this uh, is a in very interesting article by uh, uh, Quarantine that I've linked to get, uh, there. They, if you can read it, it's really interesting. Um, so for types, for non-owning reference types like string view and span, you need more contextual information when working on, on, on when with such an instance to m make up your mind about what's going on. Is it safe to use here? For example, if you see a pull request, you see a, a diff, and you see a string you used, or a span, it's not enough to see the lines changed. You, you, need, you need to understand the context. You need to understand where is this data coming from? How is it used? What's the outer context? Who's calling it? So things to consider, we've talked ab uh, about them earlier. Shallow copy, shallow versus deep compare, const and mutability. Do we have logical const or not? Um, and how operator uh, equals equals is implemented. So we have reference semantics, but without the magic that can make references safer. For example, lifetime ex extension. Again, same as string view. So that's why you have to be very careful how, to, how you use it, because st uh, string view or span will not extend the lifetime of the thing it points to. 
So be careful there. Uh, if you want uh, compiler support, this is how the situation stands right now. Uh, the only thing that works is Clang 7 or greater, but using, um, using just the um, pointer doesn't work. Using just the libc++ uh, STL. So the GCC STL doesn't have it yet. So this is the situation right now. And um, it kind of evolved from uh, Clang 7 up to Clang 9. So they, they were very early on adopting it. And this is how, the, from the initial spec, they removed the comparison operators. They did the usability improvements, like um, first, last, and stuff like that. And up to extending uh, sign size and extend for span. Uh, span will evolve even further. Uh, we have proposal for a range constructor for span, same for string view, uh, and proposals to use span of char as a, a stir stream replacement. These are not yet approved, they're in the consideration. So you cannot wait to use span, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, you do have implementations available. You have implementations in Chromium already. Uh, you have implementations in um, uh, Firefox. The implementation, by the way, related to your question, the implementation in Chromium is bounce checked. Um, so the one by uh, Tristan Brindle is more uh, close to the spec in the standard. So I would recommend that one because it's the, the most, uh, the one that's most close to what we're gonna get in, the, in C++ 20. And you do have these five phases of joy. Uh, can you guess what the problem is? What, I think you can guess what the C++ feature was. It was span. <laughs> but can you guess the problem Timur was having? It lacks a feature test macro. So you know what feature test macros are? It's a way to query to see if you have that feature as opposed, as opposed to using weird macros and compiler versions <laughs> like we used to. <laughs> so. Um, can't you use has include for that? Because span is a, it's in its own header. Uh, well, not exactly, because for example, libc++ always has all its headers in, it has implemented, and they're empty if you don't select the right C++ version when you compile. So that doesn't quite work. And yeah, you care about this stuff if you wanna be an early adopter, for example, using that uh, implementation on GitHub. So it, 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 you can do it, but it's tricky if you want to have um, zero impact when you actually get the type and you don't want to change all your code just because you switched compilers to a newer version. What do you think about this? Combining two of my favorite pet peeves into one glorious disaster. This is what I call this slide. <laughs> so a span of string views as arguments to main. Uh, from a language standpoint, makes sense. From a practical standpoint, it doesn't because you're most probably gonna end up passing one of those arguments or a processing thereof to a, some kind of API that expects a null terminated string. And string view, it doesn't guarantee it's null terminated. So. And R3 arguments can be modified. That too, <laughs> and that too. So. It looks nice on paper, not practical in reality. Um, beyond span, um, possible areas of interest uh, in ranges. I like this part more. Uh, stride view, slice view, sliding view, cycle view, chunk view. What you said about uh, go slices or, or I don't know, something similar. So these are things that I, I would much prefer over just a simple wrapper or around a pointer and a length. Um, other dimensions, there are pro proposals for way in the future for multi-dimensional span and multi-dimensional array. Uh, one is owning, one is non-owning. So big difference here. Um, you can learn more about it. I, I've put links here. Uh, there is an early implementation for MD span already available. It's all about defining data layout in memory, uh, in how you 
traverse it, how it's laid out for exotic architectures. It's very useful in, in high performance computing and in graphics. So these are interesting areas of development uh, that take it way further, way further. <laughs> so call to action would be to make your value types regular. Um, the best regular types are those that model building types. Uh, so they don't have dependent preconditions. You don't have to evaluate the context in which they're used. You can just look at them and understand their usage locally. Think integer or standard string or standard vector. Those are easy to reason about. You don't have to see the whole dependency tree there. And for non owning reference types like string view or span, uh, you do need contextual information when working on, on those. Uh, and you, when you see and do code reviews and see pull requests. And if you design types like this, because you need to, let's face it, we're not living in a bubble. We, we need to design weird types sometimes. Try to restrict them to be semi-regular. Don't, don't do the same mistakes Span did early on. Don't define operators and operations that don't follow these standard semantics. Don't try to make them look regular if they're not. Don't pretend they're values. Give the, your users the, the honest expectation. They're not values. They're not regular. So try to restrict them to be semi-regular at best. I have lots of resources here. Um, as I said, when you get the slides, if you're interested to explore more, I have tons of articles and tons of papers and resources that you can uh, follow along and read on your own pace. And that's why I care about regular types and span in particular. <laughs> and uh, thank you for coming to my talk. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them.